for Thursday, February 8th, 2018. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Whoa, 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 we can't play that much of this song. And welcome to a most packed week of stuff to talk about on This Is Only a Test. I'm Norman. Let's just jump right into it. Jeremy Williams. Hello. Kishore Hari. Hi, I'm here too. We have a spaceman. Floating. floating we have there, space. there is a spaceman out there. Starman. Starman. Yeah. Starman. Is that the official name? Yeah, that's how they were. Uh, uh, Elon referred to it. Yes. Mm. Uh, as you out, you out there may know, the biggest story this week is the Falcon Heavy, SpaceX's, the biggest rocket built so far since the, since the 60s. Yep, most powerful in-operation rocket here on Earth. Most powerful, um, highest um, capacity since the Saturn V rocket. Uh, mm-hmm. Absolutely right. And uh, it did its test launch, uh, as we're recording this, yesterday, and it was by most metrics, a huge success. I, I think it was a success on a couple levels. One, it was a success from just like purely captivating the imagination of, of people around the world. Uh, I uh, we we've talked about nostalgically used to watching all the shuttle launches when we were kids. Yep. Yeah. And then there was a period where that went away, where we stopped watching every single one. Got real nervous. And this brought back a little bit of that feeling in me of. Every one of my friends was watching this at the same time. We're all tuned in the stream, and the stream was really good. And th- this is where there's a big difference in terms of how people watched it. Of course, we're in the age of social media and I- streaming, and everyone could watch it on their phone. And I think a lot of people did. There was a lot of publicity around this. Elon Musk did several interviews, which he rarely does, uh, with web outlets, just, just talking about the importance of this. They were really hedging their bets. I think I- I'm wondering how many people watch not hoping, but thinking they could, it could have been, you know, as Elon put it, a fireworks display. Well, you know, I think for our generation, the Challenger kind of taints this launch for us. Every launch, whenever I see anything blasting up into space, I'm kind of biting my nails because I remember that. And my wife is the exact same way. Um, but yeah, I mean, knowing that they were, Elon gave it a 50 50 chance of success. I mean, knowing that, it, it was almost as if. If it, if it was successful, that's great. That's a bonus. They really just wanted to test it. There was nothing of true value on board. It was purely for testing. Well, there's definitely something of sentimental value because the big publicity stunt wasn't only at the rocket launch, but what was the payload on this rocket? Not a real payload. So, Kishore, could you explain to us when, when rocket companies do r- launches like this, of this caliber, of, at this stage in the, the testing process, typically do, they do have a payload, right? Uh, yeah, uh, there has to be some weight there. Um, weight equivalent to what the actual payloads will be when this is in in full operation. And historically, that's been uh, across a gamut. Sometimes it's been like science experiments. Sometimes it's just been a block. Um, and so this was somewhere in between those. Like this was as close as you get to having just a block of weight in mm-hmm. the payload except it was midnight cherry colored. <laughs> That's right. It was Elon Musk, as he said, his personal Tesla Roadster. Now, a lot of people thought this was the new Roadster. It's not. It's not. It's the no. classic original Roadster. The, the Lotus, the modified I, Lotus. Right. I heard it was his. Yeah. That's, That's right? the story. Like his personal one. I don't know if I buy I that don't know or what not. The, we hadn't seen even numbers. Uh, <laughs> I also don't know exactly how it was modified to be mounted. The mounting had to be, of course, very secure, and it was within the uh, the, the cavity, uh, so it didn't need to be aerodynamic or anything. I assume they pulled out um, either they pulled out a lot of the electronics of the car uh, and in, in inserted the correct weights in there so that they would be stable, mm-hmm. um, because it has to be balanced 
more yeah. than anything else. And like the car probably didn't have all of that stuff. So I imagine if we lifted up the hood, a lot of that stuff you'd you'd expect to see are, is gone. So at the very least, the chassis, the wheels, the rims, and a passenger, Starman. So this was the spacesuit that they had unveiled. I don't know if it's the spacesuit that was designed in collaboration with Ironhead Studio, but this is what's going to hopefully be on the Dragon capsule and what um, the pressure suit that the astronauts will wear. It's the suits that they'll wear that NASA astronauts will wear on their way to the International Space Station. On Being ferried by the Dragon. Exactly. That's right. Which is not an EVA suit. This no. is purely a pressure suit and, inside. And so we're going to watch it degrade mm -hmm. here because it's fully exposed to the radiation of space here. And it's right. not meant to be in a convertible car in outer space. That was a weird sentence kinda, that I said it, out loud. It kind of looked like the Stig from Top Gear with the white helmet and the white bodysuit. That's right. what it made me think of. And when it launched... Uh, let's talk about the launch itself. Well, hang on. My favorite conspiracy theory is that Elon murdered somebody and put it in the suit. And oh, now you'll never wow. find it. Yeah. Never find the evidence. This live camera. I love it. The, the, head, the helmet falls off and it's, it's just a corpse. Uh, so the, the launch itself. It was out of the Cape, Cape Canaveral. And uh, they were relatively on time. Launched on the day they did scheduled to launch, ninety percent optimal back. conditions. It got pushed back like an hour or two, right? And there were a lot of uh, simulations and rendered videos showing what was supposed to happen. So people, at least like observers like us, had an idea of this how spectacular it could be. I was so impressed by the production value of this launch, the multiple <laughs> camera setup, the the graphics in real time. Um, it made it the really easy to flip on to their channel. And follow along. They've always done that excellent timeline along the bottom of the screen for all of their launches that let you know exactly when the important events are going to happen. All the presenters are scientists and engineers that work at SpaceX, and they're all wonderfully scripted. So in a way that is very easy to understand, uh, like the different stages, and they all have their really specific roles. So you understand what this person is talking about versus that person talking about so it's not like watching a live sports game where they're kind of riffing on the run. They're reading from a teleprompter in a way that made it better. And the whole thing was really tight because basically after the the rockets landed, we'll come to that in a second, they're like, okay, see ya. Yeah. And that was yeah. it. There was like no post-show. Right. <laughs> <laughs> the after-show no. discussion. But I do love the amount of cheering that you get with the SpaceX launches in the background. You know, it's, it's like a sporting event. And it's as exciting as these launches should be to everybody. Yeah. Uh, so the launch itself went off relatively without a hitch as far as we saw. And then... The, Wait a minute. There's one big hitch. Well, the, the launch. Yeah. I'm the sorry, launch not the landing. Itself. Yeah. Right. The launch. And then, of course, the the stages, the, the three rockets that make up the Falcon Heavy split apart. And the two, uh, what are they called? The two side rockets? The boosters. The, two, the boosters. Yeah. Uh, they did their landing. Now, this is the first thing we saw. And... The camera feed, they had a camera feed on on the, the two boosters, but I think they were showing the same feed. No, no, no. They were <laughs> they looked identical. They, no, I think there were some screen star comparisons. They had cameras on both, but because of the video splitting, we, they were actually the same feed. Well, the commentators said that they weren't. They, I, they might have been mistaken. Some, some post-launch yeah. analysis has shown that they probably <laughs> were the same images with the same water yeah. droplings. Right. And huh. but the landing happened, and it was... Like the render, simultaneous. When we saw the render the day before, we watched this together and tested in the tested office, and you said, wait a minute, they're not going to land simultaneously like that together, are they? Like several hundred feet from, <laughs> an, from another. Uh, I, I was tearing up when the launch happened because this is the closest I felt to us traveling to Mars in a long time. Yeah. Uh, to humans traveling to, to Mars. And then when those rocket, the boosters landed, I went from like, being slightly emotional to being like, this is just absurd. Mm -hmm. It was absurd watching how spectacularly in sync that was. I was just thinking like with the Olympics starting in a couple of days, I'm like gold medal. Yeah. Right. Totally. <laughs> ten, totally. ten, 10, 10, 10 out of 10. Get those points numbers up. Um, But what you were saying before, did you feel the weight of the, the pressure of this launch? Just like, like you said, this is the, every success of this rocket gets us closer to to Mars. And, and to be fair, we're really far away, and there's big, big hurdles to overcome. Like especially with how humans can overcome the radiation on that on that trip, let alone some of the psychological things and and some of the other technical challenges. But yeah, yeah, I did. 
it was because it's tangible. It wasn't like, oh, we made this advance in in radiation shielding, which we, we don't see uh, realized because that's published in some academic journal and realized in some lab. And it's a small piece of technology. This is the first real tangible thing. Uh, in a number of years that we've seen that pushes us in that direction. And the fact that it was done by a, a private company takes away a little bit of that edge of, well, is NASA ever going to have the money to do this? Like it takes away some of that because it seems like he is so committed to Mars that he's going to make something happen. I think it did a lot to inspire a generation of astrophysicists as well, kids who grew up wanting to be astronauts. I think you're going to have a handful more now after this launch. A lot of people look at the Roadster in space as a publicity stunt, and I think, great. Yeah, 100% it was a publicity stunt. The space industry needs more of that. You know, NASA, NASA used to just have its own publicity stunts by being NASA, mm -hmm. but we've become so accustomed to launches that I, I'm glad that there's a little extra something that's making people tune in. What is the SpaceX equivalent of spinoffs, <laughs> right? The magazine of all the benefits, the trickle-down technologies. But no, it's private. He can keep all the patents himself. He doesn't <laughs> have to share any of that stuff. Uh, it was so surreal because there is there was a live feed of the, the Tesla and the multiple cameras. I think there are like three cameras on uh, on that car right now. Yeah. Uh, to the, the one camera, which is like the selfie cam from the outs for the car, to see the reflection of the Earth and the Moon on not only the car but also the visor, you could say you could look at that picture and say that is like all of humanity is in the reflection of a car. <laughs> all yeah. right, Carl Sagan. Let Let's just say what it was. That was the greatest car commercial <laughs> we've ever seen in the history of humankind. You can't buy it. No, like it, in a weird way, we went from Sunday when people are spending how much money. Uh, to advertise their little, you know, kitschy spots. Yeah. This is a better advertisement that will live on for decades than any of that stuff. If only the car got to land on Mars. So well, well, here's, uh, let's talk about what, where, where we're at in terms of this launch. Uh, it has been confirmed in a press conference this morning that the cent center core mm -hmm. uh, did not make it to the barge. So we had two successful landings for the boosters, but this, the central core missed its mark um, and uh, don't know the status of it currently or well, what, what caused that problem. And we've heard two different things. Um, uh, Jeremy had heard that it just simply ran out of fuel, so it just accelerated and crashed really fast into the water. 300 miles an hour. And, and that kind of speed actually damaged some of the barge too, even though it didn't hit it just from the, the concussive impact. Um, uh, I'm very curious if there is it actually just ran out of fuel or if there was some sort of actual miscommunication in terms of the rocket refiring. Right. The engines. One of the engines mm -hmm. on that core. So it's, the, it's automated. That center core was a big reason for the delays in launching this at mm -hmm. all. Um, they had planned to launch this long ago and they had redesigned the center core entirely. So I don't know. I mean, it got off the ground. You know, it served that purpose. Maybe part of the redesigns going forward are going to address the landing. I don't know. And I imagine we won't know for a while because with that kind of impact, I'm sure there is pretty catastrophic loss of any sort of forensic material. They've got I know it's just going to take them a little while to reconstruct the data. Yeah. They have uh, got. They must have amazing black box stuff on there to retrieve. Absolutely. But it's going to be at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, yeah. Well, it's also just they probably have like stuff on the water that was taking readings of it too. Yeah. The whole way, and they're probably just going through that telemetry, and we're just not going to get it for a little bit. Right. So what's going to happen to that payload? Let's talk about the uh, the Tesla and Starman. Should I play the music again? No, because <laughs> it is it is playing that music in empty space. <laughs> no one can hear it. <laughs> no one sound is. sound will not. Travel. No one can hear you scream. <laughs> but I think that's the only thing using power is the radio. It's playing, it's playing a license, hopefully a license recording yeah. mm -hmm. of, of the song, Bowie song. And uh, it, the idea was that it wasn't going to go to Mars, but it would be shot in months from now. It would be in a uh, uh, orbit around the sun that would be, uh, that would intersect with the orbit of Mars. Yeah. And there, there was a small chance that it would land on Mars accidentally, event Crash. eventually. It, that wasn't it, the, its initial design. Uh, but it would just stay in this orbit for, you know, millions of years. Yeah. And uh, th they said at the press conference afterwards that it's missed its trajectory. It's going to head out to the asteroid belt. 
Uh, the asteroid belt is not like the Star Wars asteroid belt. It's not probably not going to. Its chance of actually hitting an asteroid proper is really low. Yeah. The problem is is that it's probably being pelted with micro meteorites, me- like uh, right now, and those are going to slowly wear away the car. And then combine that with the unshielded radiation from the sun, especially as it passes away from from Earth now and it, it exits the magnetic magnetic shielding of the Earth. It's just going to slowly wear down. Now, do you think there? I mean, there were no solar panels on this rig, so power even for the cameras and transmission system will wear It'll out. It'll get fried. Oh, that would be like I know that's a huge I mean, endeavor. Is they it, didn't disclose it. Maybe they put some amazing radiation shielding on the camera equipment. Is, uh, and is then the, power would be needed, too. Mm-hmm. Well, it's, it's got a little bit of a battery on there. Right, but like I'm, I'm talking about something indefinite. Yeah. Right. 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 Radi- there, where years from now, you could tune in and see what Starman's up so to. So is, con- is it still broadcasting? Because oh. we were getting a live feed for several hours. I don't know if it's still broadcasting today. Last time I checked was last night and it was still broadcasting. Was that bo- after the third burn? Mm-hmm. Oh, wow. That's cool. But uh, when you said it still has a battery on there, you're not talking about the car battery, right? Well, they are, they're running Space Odyssey. I don't know if, if they're There's actually... There's no way they left the car battery in there. Why not? Because it's a liquid battery. I don't think it would work. Hmm. For, like the radiation would fry that pretty quickly. Hmm. Hmm. I, I mean, they might have put extra shielding on the car, but usually radiation shielding is in the form of like water that's deflecting... Yeah, the radiation away, and they—that's heavy. They didn't put that on there. No, this is the prologue of a science fiction book that takes place (laughs) many thousands years from now on a colony in Mars, where the car comes back, and and instead of V'ger, it's Tilla. Tilla Tilla comes back. (laughs) There's a lot of reasons to be cynical in this world uh, about anything like this. How how was it yesterday when you were watching? Were you were you excited? Were you just like uplifted? I was lonely office and fist pump in the air. Yeah, that's <laughs> how I felt too. Oh, I was I was extremely jazzed about it. I love the the don't panic on the dashboard. That's a nice little. <laughs> it was a nice touch. Yeah, it was a nice touch having all the names engraved of the people that worked on it. I didn't know that. Um, they that's had a cool. plaque that's you know underneath the car that has six thousand names engraved on it. Oh, hmm. that's great. That's great. Yeah. So that's the the big story this week. Uh, there's plenty of details you can find on uh, SpaceX's website and plenty of people covering it in the space and science community. Uh, we'll be following along, and if there are any other developments and news, we'll share it as well on the podcast. <laughs> Pop culture news. Wow. That was new. <laughs> no, you called Audible there. <laughs> hey, we, for, we forgot something um, really quickly. Oh. A listener sent in video that they took themselves, or at least found online, of amateurs taking video of the simultaneous landing of the boosters. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I saw and that you got to see, like, hear the sonic boom um, as they came in, which I thought was really neat. So y- you can just search YouTube for those. those they, made really a, fun. they made a boom on re-entry? I mean, coming yeah. back, that's cool. Wow. All right, no need to play the music again. How did you guys spend your weekend, Your your uh, the, the big game weekend, the Superb Owl? Uh, so I spent uh, most of Saturday prepping for my chicken wing party, and then most of Sunday cooking and eating chicken wings. Of which I enjoyed many. Yeah, there was also a game of some sort. Yeah, yeah. Did you watch, Jeremy, did you watch the Superb Owl? No. No? Nope. No interest. No interest. You you went Disneyland. Went, went out on town and found That's an empty cool. empty uh, empty like, place to be in. Is this like a lifelong thing? Like you're just not into football and so why watch the Super Bowl? Uh I suppose so. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know I, I'm I'm so not into it. I've never even given that question any thought. I, yeah, I mean Have you I, ever watched the Super Bowl? Yes. Okay. Yes. I suppose I probably lived somewhere some time when <laughs> they were in the Super Bowl. In another life. Yeah. Um well, it happened, and many things related to pop culture happened as well. We're going to talk about it. Uh, some of the commercials, because sure, I know you didn't get the chance to watch a lot of it because you were making chicken wings. Did you go back after I was the fact watching. and watching some of those you ads? Know, you know, we had four TVs in that game, and there was a secret TV that you couldn't see that was behind near the fryers. Oh, really? That nice. we had going, too. That's sweet. Yeah. So uh, we had a pretty extensive setup. So I think I caught most of everything. Um, I have to say, first of all, the game. The game was good. Surprisingly. It's, it's always good to see Tom Brady get his ass handed to him. So 
There you go. So sad. And it's always fun to see the hijinks of our Philadelphia brethren as they destroy small parts of their city. Philly special. The greased poles are Mm, are my favorite little part of of that story. So the the game was good. Uh, Let's start there. Um, What about half? Did you care about halftime? Did you feel like halftime was a thing? That that I I felt underwhelmed. Uh, I'm always fascinated by the production of halftime and how much rehearsal and setup has to go into turning a football game, uh, a football field into a platform for a 15 minute musical performance. Uh, that I thought is, is logistics of that is always fun to think about. Yep. Um, Justin Timberlake was the halftime show performer. He went into the stands and took selfies with a kid who then posted it. And that kid instantly became a meme. Um, searching sure on Google, who is Justin Timberlake? Best picture uh, with Conor McGregor ever. Yeah, that's right. That's my favorite. Um, and but other than that, I, I thought it was unremarkable halftime show. Like you said, the game was great. But the ads, I thought the ads were lacking this year. They they weren't, weren't that many memorable ones. Yeah. Yeah, we were way past the years of Bud Wise <laughs> or, or What's Up. Oh, yeah. Who what's Up was that? a Super Bowl commercial. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and, and it's multiple variants. Uh, but we did Look, have... Let, let's do a quick rundown of your reactions to commercials. Okay. Um, Infinity War. Uh, so trailers. So there were, I, I believe, five movie trailers. There were five trailers, yeah. Uh, Infinity War, meh. Yeah, it was very, meh. I, thought, I thought it was really quite poor. Yeah. It was uh, a really bad spend. It was a montage, and my fear for that movie now, which I, I it's a rational fear, just based on the trailers, is that there's so many characters, that the trailer basically is just a super cut of the different characters you'll see on screen. Oh, look, it's Spider-Man. Oh, look, it's Doctor Strange. Oh, look, it's the Guardians of the Galaxy. And so you get no sense of plot. And so my fear for that film is that it's going to be the same thing, where it's going to jump between all these places, and we get no plot. That's right. And um, I refuse to acknowledge any of those criticisms. I'm just have blinders on right now. Okay. All right. What about The Rock making impossible jumps into buildings? Yeah. Did you like that? Cannibalp the film. (laughs) Wait, what's it called, actually? It's called Skyscraper. And basically, it looks like a remake of Die Hard. Um, and uh, the trailer was the, the rock on, at the edge of a skyscraper in construction, running off of a construction crane, and jumping off, and then presumably landing safely. Now, there's a movie poster for that tra- uh, for that movie uh, uh, teaser poster that shows that very scene. And astute scientists and physicists have now uh, figured out it, it would be impossible, no matter where he jumped, what speed he was running at, to make that jump. Completely impossible. He's the rock. Don't let physics define him. That's true. Um, so uh, the other interesting about, thing about that film is that The Rock has a prosthetic leg in that film, which I thought was a really cool character twist. Interesting choice. Maybe from yeah. falling off skyscraper so much. Uh, but let's get to the big trailer, Solo. Yeah, so what was different about the one that they aired in Super Bowl versus what I saw online? The one you saw online on Monday morning on Good Morning America, there were two different takes. Solo, as they showed it, 30-second spot on the Super Bowl, was the teaser for the next morning full teaser. Uh huh. So it was a subset of those shots done uh, to say, stay tuned, the full trailer coming out the next day. And then the full trailer omitted some of the shots that we saw in the Super Bowl, including the cool Lando shot. Uh, so you got to watch both Ooh. really to get all the shots. How about them? Uh, thoughts on Solo? I was underwhelmed by oh. a, a, a pretty big degree. Wow. Th- by the trailer or? By the trailer. By Okay, yeah. I mean, obviously, you haven't seen the movie yet. Mm. But no, I'm just wondering if, if like, uh, because I thought the trailer production values weren't that great. Like, when, when the, the Solo logo comes on, it just looks like an After Effects afternoon. You know, like somebody made that. It, didn't, it was not impressive. The music sounds very synthy to me. It just didn't feel like very a great modern. trailer. It was a, the, the, the cut of the music with the quick cuts and the matching to the synthy beats, yeah. I felt was very modernized, which is, I think, a fine take. It doesn't have to be epic and john williamsy mm-hmm. uh i i think it's surprise i i'm gonna go i'm gonna say regardless of what you think of the actor playing han solo um i don't like, know anything about him he was in one prior film two prior films he was in um the hail caesar mm. uh, i know a lot of people are not happy with the casting mm. uh, regardless of that i did see and hear some of han solo in his performance see yeah. that's my main complaint i didn't feel like i got much han out of him Mm-hmm. I, I mean, you're not going to get Harrison Ford. That's, no, I, I think people want Harrison Ford. No, but I wanted the cocky. I, there I wanted was the cocky. I didn't get it. There was cocky. You know, there was like well, you thought we were in trouble. We're, we're, yeah. we're in trouble. 
I don't know. I I really liked the the Lando character. Uh, you Donald get Glover. Donald Glover so little Good. of him, but he's my favorite part. Like he's, he's the original owner of the Falcon. He embodied Lando in a smile, and that's all I got. But I was like, that's Lando. Yep. Um, you saw Chewie with a new bandolier, an old bandolier, I guess, uh, before he has a single sling. And then I, the opening shots of the trailer, where you see him going up to the Imperial officer and applying to be a pilot. This is cool backstory, and the, the, these are parts of the Imperial, the Empire we never got to see. A Star Destroyer in this storm cloud, this I, nebula. I thought you meant their HR process. Well, <laughs> yeah, that too, but <laughs> that the, too. the scope of like more than just officers in the on the bridge of a Star Destroyer, you know, or in a hangar. Mm-hmm. Like this, is a different part of the Empire. So the backstory of the Falcon is, uh, is Han wanted off Lando, right, in a gambling. Yeah. So do you think we'll see that? I think we'll see that. Do you think we'll see the Kessel Run? I, th- I think so. The last shot of the trailer, the last sequence in the full trailer, is the main cast. Uh, they're running away from Tie Fighters, and the, the Falcon does this. Qu- I love the the physicality of the the steering wheel of the Falcon. He mm-hmm. like he's turning these things and and making the Falcon do these crazy flips. I feel like there's some of that in the new trilogy too. Yeah, but like this is tying back to the modifications, the special modifications oh, for this the right. ship. Right? How else would you have these maneuvers? Right. Uh, but they're going through this. What looks like this storm cloud and there's a crazy beast in there and people have speculated that is the Kessel Run. No. Oh. Okay. So people, but people have speculated. Are you are you guys in the camp where you feel like they need to, they need to show and answer the parsec question of the Kessel Run? <laughs> They'll probably make reference to it. I, I hope they just make a joke about just it. Just fan service. And just yeah. be done with it. Because some you, people really, really want to see that paradox or that that that, that logic hole fu- fulfilled. Mm-hmm. Why? Because they're super fans. Yeah. Because they need. Because they're sticklers. No, yeah. you're referring to the parsec as used in the New Hope as a unit of time, when as it's opposed a, to a actually unit of, a unit of distance. And so the the prevailing fan theory, and I think it might even be in the extended universe uh, canon, is that. Uh, the Kessel Run is made up of tiny black holes, and so for a <laughs> pilot to maneuver through in the shortest amount of distance okay. would be an achievement, right. uh, as opposed to uh, time. Please no. Yeah. <laughs> Please. I'm with you on that. I'm with you. No. All right. I hope they on. just make a joke where he like mispronounces a word. Like, I just pronounce it parsec. But Ray says it seriously yeah, in Force Awakens. Is uh, is the is the female? Um, Lady Targaryen, the the dragon mom from uh, Game of Thrones. Amelia Clark. Yeah. yeah. It yes, is? Yes, yeah. that's her. Who was in Terminator. She played Sarah Connor. In no, the I didn't Terminator know Terminator reboot. How about Genesis. Uh, well, she, mysterious character. Uh, we skipped over another trailer that dropped out of nowhere, the Cloverfield Paradox. Ah. Uh, well, During I want to talk about that last. Okay. Let's talk about the big budget. So there's Jurassic World, which, um, <laughs> eh, and this is actually the most watched trailer of the Super Bowl after the fact. More than uh, Solo? More than Solo. What? It was because the way they marketed this one, which was watch the TV commercial and then go online and watch the full trailer. So people had to call the action immediately, not waiting for the next day to tune in to GMA. Uh, what? Uh, Mission Impossible, Fallout. Oh, I'm I didn't so, see that. so in for this. 100% down. I love those films. You know what? I didn't see the last Mission Impossible, which was great, right? It was so good. Yeah. Well, and who, I think that's why I'm not back in. I need to watch that movie. Who directed that last one? Christopher McQuarrie. Who's that? He, uh, he wrote The Usual Suspects, and oh. he's written a lot of films recently. He did uh, some writing work on Rogue One. He uh, wrote The Last Mission Impossible. He wrote uh, the Tom Cruise movie um, uh, Live, Die, Repeat, um, uh, All You Need Is Kill. Oh, uh, yeah. Uh, he's not related to Ralph McQuarrie. No, no, no. That would be amazing. Uh, but so, the, his first directorial debut was The Last, Mis- not Last Mission Impossible, and he is taking on this one, which is the direct sequel. Oh, he's he's doing this this one too. Yes. How about that? Yeah. All right. Yeah. So I'm really excited for that. There's a stunt. Oh, the thing I'll say about the Mission Impossible trailer. Two things I'll say because you have to listen. One is uh, Tom Cruise broke his ankle on a stunt he did because he does his own stunts, and they use the take where he broke his ankle oh. in the trailer and presumably in the film, which is him running across a rooftop and making a jump. And so in the trailer, if you freeze frame a moment, you see his foot hitting the wall mm. and hitting it at a awkward angle and it looks painful people love this schadenfreude you know they just get off on seeing people hurt themselves I don't know I still think that's better than black hole explanations for parsecs <laughs> <laughs> the other thing is that this is also the movie the Paramount film that has Henry Cavill and is the reason for 
the Superman mustache CG fiasco of Justice League. We've sign- finally seen. And now we know what it looks like. The $40 million like. mustache. And Harry Ca- Henry Cavill looks awesome in this film, and his action sequences in the trailer are great, so maybe it was worth it. No. <laughs> no, 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 I'm not going to just buy that. Okay, uh, next movie trailer, uh, did we talk about all of them? I think we talked about all the major ones. There's all a right. couple of smaller ones. But let, let's go to Cloverfield, I think. Yeah, so a huge surprise. Uh, Netflix put a movie trailer out for the Cloverfield Paradox surprise movie. No one had really heard of it uh, unless unless they're following movie blogs. And then the bigger surprise, which no one knew, was that they released it on Netflix right after the Super Bowl. Oh, wow. So they spent $5 million to buy a 30-second ad to advertise a movie that they then immediately released right after. What, what was weird about it is the initial ad said coming soon. I was like, oh, that'll be out in a few weeks. And then there was a second ad, right? That said, watch it that now. That was a watch it now. And I was like, what? That's, How'd that? That was a quick turn. It was really yeah. soon. Yeah. So Netflix, uh, the reports are that Netflix apparently spent $50 million buying the rights to distribute this, uh, which doesn't include home video or, or um, few, uh, European or uh, international distribution from Paramount. And the Paramount was going to put this in theaters in April, but they did not feel good about the film. So... They didn't think it was going to be a hit. They were afraid they'd have to spend money on marketing. And so this was a safe way for them to recoup their costs, make money, and for Netflix to get, a, honestly, a bunch of publicity about changing the way movies are distributed. Now, and I think they would have had success in this route if the movie was good. Yeah, see, that's a problem. Uh, you can get away with this if the movie's any good. Did you watch it? I did. I, I did what Netflix wanted me to do. Was it right after the football <laughs> game? I put it, it on. So, and I said, oh, you know what? I'm glad that was on Netflix because I paid for it already. Where does it fit in the Cloverfield timeline? So uh, have you guys seen Cloverfield? I, seen Cloverfield saw the ori- I saw the original. All right. A little bit of history for you folks out there. J.J. Uh, Abrams produced a movie called Cloverfield with Ma- directed by Matt Reeves, who has since gone on to direct the Two of the Planet of the Apes films. And also he did Let the Right One In, a remake of Let Me In, or Let Me In, remake of Let the Right One In, the vampire film. And then also he's directing the upcoming Batman film. But the original Clover film, Cloverfield film mm-hmm. was 2008? 2008, and it was teased in a trailer that was very mysterious, shrouded in mystery. It was a whole J.J. Abrams joint back in the heyday of Lost, right? Produced by J.J. Abrams. And one of the mysteries of the film was, one, uh, what was the name of the film? Because Cloverfield was just supposed to be a placeholder name, even in the trailer. Okay. And so they went to Comic-Con, and there were rumors leading up to it that the movie was actually going to be called Monstrous, which I, my theory is that that's what the movie was called. But there was such internet backlash circa 2008 against the name Monstrous that the movie ended up being just called Cloverfield. The word is never mentioned even in, um, in the movie itself. So it's Cloverfield, whatever. So there's always this, like, this chip on its shoulder of mystery the first film, and I enjoyed the first film. You know, found footage film, big monster film, um, told the story in an interesting way, and uh, people liked it. It kind of ended on a little bit of a cliffhanger. Um, then, just is it two years ago now, last year was it last year. No, no, it was a couple of years. Two ago. years ago, uh, Ten Cloverfield Lane came out, and the trailer for that came out of nowhere. Mm-hmm. And so, much like Cloverfield, the first movie came came out of nowhere. Ten Cloverfield Lane came out of nowhere. And um, that the only tie between that and Cloverfield really was in the name. Ten Cloverfield Lane refers to the location where it takes place, and it is a uh, thriller. John Goodman and Mary Elizabeth Weinstead. Joey liked a, that a lot, uh, and I enjoyed it too. It's a great movie. It's directed by uh, Dan Trackenberg, who uh, did that Portal short and was attached to do um, Why the Last Man. Um, for all, he also directed one, an episode of uh, Black Mirror, the video game one. Hmm. Um, but uh, the reports on that was it was a script that had nothing to do with Cloverfield and, and aliens and monsters. Purely a thriller about a man and a woman trapped in a um, in a, a, a bomb shelter, a bomb shelter, fallout shelter, and a psychological thriller. In that, bad robot got the rights to it and then developed it and added these elements to kind of give it an extra air of mystery mm-hmm. and create this now shared Cloverfield cinematic universe but never written from scratch as being a cloverfield film which i think it was fine it was work people were excited by it and then this cloverfield paradox apparently is the same thing except further 
more. This one was it was originally called the God Particle, uh, written by um, was it Dave uh, Dave Young. I forget the the, the writer, the same writer of, as uh, the short story of Arrival that Arrival is based on. Um, the story of your life. Any relation? I mean, is it about the Higgs boson or? Yeah, that's what the idea, the, a particle accelerator in space was oh. the premise of um, the God particle. And apparently they made this film, had no references to Cloverfield or anything, and then did reshoots and added those <laughs> references once Bad Robot got a hold of it wow. to, again, tie it into this shared Cloverfield universe. And it didn't really work. This is the worst uh, persuasion to watch a movie ever. <laughs> I'm not saying watch the movie. I'm just going to give you some context. Yeah, the context is hurting this movie. Well, I mean, did you actually, could you get a feel for that, that it had been shoehorned together? Yes. Really? Very much so. Huh. Uh, like people had longer hair? Like No, no, no. It wasn't as bad as like uh, when uh, All the Money in the World where they took out Kevin Spacey and do reshoots with Mark Wahlberg yeah. and, and um, Christopher Plummer. Uh, but definitely did not feel like it was of the world of Weird. either of those past two films. Well, do you know what the Rotten Tomatoes score of the Cloverfield Paradox is? I believe it's 23%. It's gone down, my friend. 18%. Ooh, not very good. So, And, and not even like with Bright, where the audi- there is a core part of the audience that liked Bright. Yeah. That appreciated Bright. I, I think people like the audience hates this movie too. Bummer. Well, let me tell you this: if you're not interested in Cloverfield, I mean, like, the, there is another Cloverfield movie already in the works. How do you know this? You're not supposed to know about know. Cloverfield. I'm, I'm spilling all the beans. Wow. There's a fourth one, Cloverfield Four, and it's a period piece, World War II movie with zombies. What if? What if it like dropped like right after figure skating next week to the Olympics? It's like that would be pretty cool. Clo- Cloverfield zombies. It's too much money. Uh, Nick or uh, Will made a good uh, good point on the podcast. I'm still entitled this week and said Netflix has really changed the landscape of direct to video releases, direct to DVD. Uh, you know that's what this felt like. It, that's totally what this felt like. This would have been fine if it was a good movie. That's yeah, it. yeah. And as it was, I, and they knew it wasn't a good movie. See, the, my my th- question though is based on the strength of the Cloverfield brand as it were, that Bad Robot has built, would people, would they have been able to sell $50 million worth of tickets at the box office uh, if they had released it in April as originally planned? I don't know. I'm, be- I'm betting they're thanking their lucky stars right now. Paramount, who previously Yeah, 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 that, yeah. That Netflix picked it up. And, and, and but maybe, on the other hand, maybe it was worth it to Netflix. Because ne- they got all this. We're talking about it. Exactly. And the, the, all they care about is their subscriber base and keeping that strong and hopefully increasing. Yeah. And, and so having Cloverfield on the list of movies you get for free, it's probably a good thing. And as someone who's a Netflix subscriber, like, is your expectation, like, you're going to get the licensed films, your whatever Disney films and Paramount films and Fox films that and TV shows that can roll down Netflix. But in terms of original content, we have this high expectation on Netflix for quality TV programming because they've spent all this money on House of Cards, Orange New Black, and dozens of other shows now that are many in well re- high regard. Uh, comedy specials, which they spent you know hundreds of million dollars yeah. on. Uh, but can you say the same about their original movie programming? You know, Bright and War Machine and now Cloverfield, these Netflix licensed originals or self-produced originals. Not enough data yet. Hmm. Because I think they've earned enough goodwill with the quality of the original TV production to give it a few chances to get it right. I don't think the economics work out for them. That's probably it. I mean, there is a Scorsese Netflix film, I think, that's in the works, and we'll see how that goes. Um, Anyway, uh, that's... That's all I got to say about the Cloverfield Paradox. Good. I, I would not recommend That's it. That's a lot. Yeah. All right. Quickly moving on. Black Panther coming out next Friday. Uh, I got my tickets. Reviews went out this week, uh, and they are 99% on Rotten Tomatoes. Hype train is out of control on this movie. I'm so excited. I'm excited to see something really different yeah. from the Marvel Universe. Yeah. Well, you might be seeing something different in the Star Wars universe in the next couple of years because not only is the ex- the new trilogy wrapping up, but we're also getting Ryan Johnson's take on a new trilogy. And just announced yesterday, the showrunners of Game of Thrones, David Benioff and um, the other uh, guy, the other guy, <laughs> uh, are writing and producing another new trilogy. Money, complete original for theaters. Uh, unbelievable. I was not expecting Star Wars to really go down the nudity hole <laughs> and the, and just the, the Bring brutal it. violence. Bring it. R-rated Star Wars. You really? You're into that? Uh, well, you know what? At this point, like, they're just 
ex- experiment. That's the best I can hope for right now. Right. Is to keep experimenting until it gets interesting. I well, only say that because you were disappointed with the last one. Yeah, maybe because they're playing too safe. Oh, you. Oh, okay. I don't know. All right. I'm actually. I feel like I feel pretty good about this. Yeah. Especially since they're giving them multiple movies, which is what I think these guys are good at. Is is length of time. Do you think that fans will get less precious about no. Star Wars? As time goes on and we have more of this universe shown on screen. Wait, did I say that louder? No. Mm. I'm with you. I'm surprised that they're, well, that I, I agree that they should be giving them a long period of time to work with. And you said multiple movies, but I'm surprised they're not giving them a series on the upcoming, you know, uh, Disney network that you'll be able to subscribe to. And that's the other big news. Bob Iger in a shareholder call said that they are working, and everyone knows this, on a Disney app, a Netflix competitor, which yeah. will probably mean all of our Disney movies, all the Marvel movies, Pixar movies will be taken off things like Netflix and exclusive to this new vault. Uh, but they're going to do original programming, and they are in, they're developing multiple Star Wars TV shows. That three billion dollars they spent on Lucasfilm sure looks like and good ju- money, and not just cartoon good money spent. Yeah, like live, live action, action right. stuff. Right. We've heard rumors of this for a while. I, I'm not excited about live action because I guess I'm I'm imagining that it's going to be serialized. So at some point there will be more, and I, I guess if you count Rebels and all this, all the content built around ex- extended universe, there's more Star Wars than what Lucas had planned, and that there's. All the mentions that, that were in canon in the first, in the original trilogy and the prequel trilogy will have been mined. Every reference to a planet, every reference to a thing. Yeah. So people are just going to be pulling things out of thin air and just branding it Star Wars. Well, that's supposedly what the new Ryan Johnson is about. And it's, you know, far away. So what, what holds them all together? It's just, yeah, the force. <laughs> <laughs> it binds us all together. Yeah. <laughs> It is. It is. Uh, hopefully, there will be the force and everything. At least some element of it. Right. But there's right. also like the rules, the 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 aesthetic, it know, being a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away. The fact no. that that technology ages and looks bad, like it's a, like it's a, the old west. Every like, every ten episodes, they'll they'll be like mention Luke Skywalker in passing. No, I mean <laughs> like it could be they, a different time time yeah, period. It could be a yeah. thousand years before, a thousand years after. Yeah. Uh, at some point, you'll be able to watch a Star Wars movie, and have almost no connection to the original trilogy, to A New Hope. So, so we both have good examples of this and bad. Like Agents of S.H.I.E.L.D. was trying to do this, and it hasn't really been that successful. But that was mined off of the comic book universe, which was well-developed and well-loved and well-shared. This is, there is, outside the EU, which is no longer canon, they're just coming up with stuff and then putting the label on it. Yeah, I mean, the other the other example that comes to mind is Legion, which was my favorite TV show of last year, which is in the same universe as like X-Men and those those shows, but not technically parallel dimension. Okay, fine. Fine, Norm. But the point is it it has its own style and own quality that doesn't really o- obey all of those universe conditions set upon it. And if that's what it ends up being, awesome. Are you, I mean, are you, it's a foregone conclusion I'm going to sign up for this service. Same way? Yeah, you? yeah. I think so. So I, whatever these live action films are or uh, series are, I'm sure, that, I mean, I don't know. I'm going to watch them. Yeah, they're, they're in a position unlike Netflix, which has to pay for licenses, develop original programming, and then buy spend you know tens of millions or spend $100 million on movies that all are on this one service. Disney is already in on these these distribution channels, existing ones, where they can get your $12 a month or $10 a month or whatever it is to watch their library content, their old content, that they'll spend some money on making new TV shows for and then still get you in the theater to watch Star Wars and Pixar films and Marvel films. Every year. Every year. That's a lot of money they're making. Yeah, they want it all. They do. They do. Uh, One final bit in pop culture. Uh, I want to share two things I did recently. Uh, one, I did an escape room. I mentioned this on Stolen Title. Mm-hmm. I forgot to talk about it last week. It was Palace Games Escape Room in the Bay Area, and I cannot recommend this enough. So the, is it at the Palace of Fine Arts? It is. So is it where the Exploratorium used to be? A uh, different entrance, not the side entrance, but I believe it is does share some of that same space. Hmm. They have. It is not a temporary thing. They've built into really? the infrastructure. of it, it was not a pop-up. My fear was yeah. that it was just a pop-up, use a room, and built it out. No, it is. Construction was done, wow. and walls were put in, and it is a established location now. 
and it is uh i've i've done the escape room at japantown here which is more like a like an empty office type of room with puzzles and ikea furniture that they put in uh this is the opposite end of the opposite end of that where the production value is really really nice and the story they're trying to tell uh which is tied to uh turn of the century america um you know Palace Which, of Fine Arts, yeah. perfect for location, 1915 uh, PPIE, Pan Pacific International Exposition. Um, it's all in theme with that. And you said they have three escape rooms there. They do. You've only done... I've only done the one, the one. Roosevelt Room. They have uh, Houdini, Roosevelt, and Edison. Are, Edison they all, one. are they all connected somehow? They uh, they start off with Houdini, and there is a story that weaves through the three, I hear. Huh. But you can apparently do them out of order as well. And you liked so it. Did. I loved it. Did you win? Did. Yes, uh, I will say, and this is purely a philosophical, like a like a philosophical thing, depending on how you like your escape rooms. Uh, this is not an escape room where you are actually locked in the room. Hmm. If there is a door and it is unlocked, if you need to go to the bathroom, you can actually go to the bathroom. But you have a limited amount of time. You do. It's ninety minutes, um, and the attendant who runs the escape room uh, occasionally will come into the room and see how everyone's doing, uh, and will give a hint if you want it. And sometimes give a hint even if you don't want it. And I, Ooh, that's I the part like I don't that. like. I don't because they want you to win. Because they want you to feel satisfied. They um, want you to finish. Well, don't don't you think? Because because I I never understood that about the one we went to because we yeah. just, we didn't win the the no, one in Japan no. town, but so close. We're very close. And yet I can't do it again. What's no, the point? Because they walk you through the rest of the puzzles. Right. In, in those and most escape rooms. They're not replayable. They walk you through the rest of the puzzles to show yeah. how much you had left. And there's a progress bar of some yeah. kind. But as the game master, he has a sense of how much time you have left and yes. how much more game you have. Right. And it's like playing a video game. Anyone who's played, you know, uh, um, uh, what's the 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 braid in the second, the island? Um, oh, um, the witness. witness. Right. You, you know, when you're playing a game like The Witness, or even Myst at home, the original escape yeah. room, digital escape room, you can stare at a puzzle for an hour, and that aha moment of discovery yeah. is really, that's what you're paying for. That's when all the dopamine drops. When an attendant comes in and says, you're close, or <laughs> check out that thing, like, yeah. those hints... I I do like the hint system. Like, I did a, a series in Vegas where they were monitoring you by camera, and you could audibly call for a hint. Mm-hmm. And we and we had to do this once, and I'm not spoiling much. We were in one that had this electromagnetic door. Yeah. And we unleashed it, but the magnet kept holding it a little bit, and like we just had to push really, really hard. Yeah. I I agree. And and that's when like we called for a hint, and that was super helpful. We yeah. needed that extra bit because sometimes the rooms don't work exactly you, like you need them to. You solve the principle. Of yeah. The exactly. And I I feel like those dot connecting elements where you see something beginning of the room or the beginning of the series puzzles that you have to make that dot connection to toward the end. I don't want the hint there. I hear you. What you would rather lose. I, I mean, would rather lose or I'd rather spend too much time. Yeah. You want that. the choice. And, right. and as opposed to going to gamefacts.com <laughs> escape room. Did you know the, the other nine people in the escape yes, room? Yes. It was you? for a birthday event. Okay. So that, that helps. That helps a lot. lot right? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so I think we want to do this one, the, the Edison one. We'll get a tested team together. And, yeah, sign and me up, and man. Talk about it on a future episode of the podcast. Uh, other thing I did was uh, I went on a train ride. I, I did talk about this on uh, Still in Title as well, but again, highly recommended. I've taken that route, and I've been in the parlor room before, the Coast Starlight, I think. Pacific Parlor Car. Yep. A- and um, uh, it's just it's a wonderful experience to be on that car because it's such a throwback. I understand you talked about this on Still Entitled, so you have a lot of details on the other podcast people can hear about. Yes. But th- this, was, this was a sweet thing you guys did because it was the last time they were using this particular car. It was, the, right? it was literally, the, literally the last ride. People, who, the attendants, were joking about taking pieces of the car home <laughs> with them that night. So and last, like on the 11th hour, you guys bought tickets and just decided, let's do this. And you hopped the on the train. The day before, hopped on the train, and we were the last people, last guests on that car, oh. the last stop in oh. L.A. I wonder where the car goes. Probably to a private collector or to a to a storage facility. I don't know. Where did you, what what happens with trains? Are we ready for the actual tech news now? We are. All right. Uh, let's talk about some big events in technology. Well. Some of our friends mm. 
in other tech outlets got to go to a hands-on event and try out the Labo, Nintendo Labo system. And they did. They did. Um, Engadget, TechCrunch, they all they all went and uh. they spent a day building the cardboard motorcycles and the keyboards, uh, and they had fun. They had fun with what part? Like uh, the building, the building, the building, and 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 also the, the okay. That's the, what we the expected. Versatility of the sensors. No, I, because what I fully expect is that the building of this is going to be fun. Yeah. The user experience of of using this is going to be mixed. You you don't think they'll like they'll perform as well? No, as. it's made of cardboard. I I just can't imagine a system where. It's going to work perfectly, especially if yeah. kids are building these. You're things. talking about like contraptions and electronics that usually require very tight tolerances. Yeah. And cardboard does not deliver like, that. Like, what are the chances that the piano is going to play perfectly? <laughs> right. right. You know, it's. Yeah. And, I, I just, the, I'm 90% about learning how they work. Like, oh, huh, yeah. You know what I, I mean? Like, totally agree. And that's the building of it. Like, I don't just enjoy the, the folding and the constructing. I actually want to figure out how is this sensor sensing this and what's causing this to work. That's what I'm looking forward to. The because, fishing rod is the one that I was really interested in and because there's a reeling mechanism yeah. in it. And they didn't, the, the one I read didn't finish building the fishing rod in like the 50 minutes of allotted time. So they will take a lot of time to actually put together. No judgment. Punching out those cardboard pieces. I'm, I'm looking forward to it. It's coming up like in three months. I'm just saying, if they'd invited tested, we would have finished. We would have we we <laughs> killed. We would have not only bought my own cardboard. Not only would we have done it. Cutting that. I mean, we would already be creating custom hacked components. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, the photos of the completed um, the sets including the robot, the backpack, and the, the keyboard, they look really nice, like much nicer than I thought they, they would be. From So I, I wonder how big that box is going to be that all this comes in. There's a mean? lot of pieces to it. What do you mean they look nice? Like the, like they, the cardboard? They, yeah, they, they, look, they, they look good. Yeah. That does look good. So I'm excited. Sign me up. All right. Um, I've ordered mine. Uh, me too. It's not cheap. I don't have a Switch. so I haven't ordered <laughs> Yeah, start there. Uh, let's go back to some Apple news. Um, iOS 11.3 beta is out. It's yeah, the beta is out, and the so that we now have details on what this uh, turn off the um, the ramping down of the power problem. It's not looks a like. it's not a slider. It's not a toggle slider. Well, no, and it's not a permanent slider. More to the point. So as we've talked about before, if you have an older phone and your battery starts to go. Um, what the phones have been doing is they throttle down and now there's, you know, lawsuits and, uh, some bad press. So Apple's come out and they said, okay, fine. We'll let you control this yourself. If you want, if you have a dying battery, you want full power and you know, a one hour battery life, it's up to you. So now we know what that looks like. You go into your settings and, uh, it will tell you if your battery's working fine. If it's not, it will say, uh, your iPhone has experienced an unexpected shutdown because the battery was unable to deliver necessary power. So you can disable this. And you hit disable, now you're in this mode. Look at that chunk of text. Yeah. This is the least Apple-y thing ever. And then the dismiss looks like, or the disable, is just like the end in blue text. It's not even a no, button. like a hyperlink. Yeah. But then there's no way to turn it back on. The only way to get this thing back on, at least in the beta, Turn on the throttling. Yeah, is to allow your phone to die, and then it re get punished. And every time, by the way, every time it dies, this gets automatically turned back on. There's yep. no way to keep it off permanently. Sure, sure. So there you go. Um, you know, I, I think it's fine. I mean, it's better than nothing. If you really have a problem, the batteries are thirty bucks. If you can get one, which by the way is not easy. The appointments are hard to get. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there'll also be there's an additional notification that pops up in this menu system. Uh, for when your battery's health is significantly degraded. So it's another link to get a replacement battery appointment set up, uh, which is their path going forward uh, for for renewable uh, for re, uh, consumables on the phones. The battery is a consumable, something that they expect you to replace every couple of years. Um, it's kind of like the Wi-Fi feature on the iPhone. You ever notice this in the iOS, the Wi-Fi feature? What's that? When I turn off Wi-Fi mm -hmm. on an Android phone or an old phone, the, my thinking is that Wi-Fi, the radio is turned off. Oh, you're talking about iOS 10 or whatever we're on. Yeah. Yeah. And the newest version of iOS for the past year, the Wi-Fi toggle 
when you flip it off, it flips off. But if you even jump in the Wi-Fi menu to look at what options are available, signal wise, yeah. it flips the Wi-Fi back on. Oh, it assumes that because that. you look at the menu, mm-hmm. you want Wi-Fi back on. It, it assumes it, that if you go into airplane mode and turn on airplane mode again, off, Wi-Fi will be back on. Android 8.1, well, actually in Oreo in 8.0, it'll automatically turn on Wi-Fi back on for you. I don't like that. If I, if I, if my, because sometimes I turn Wi-Fi off intentionally because I know the Wi-Fi signal is weak while my cellular signal is strong. Yeah, and dude. I, I don't understand this at all. It must, it must be they have X number of support calls due to people being confused about their Wi-Fi setting. I think they're, they're making a leap in judgment about the intentionality of if you're checking on anything with Wi-Fi, if you're going into the Wi-Fi menu at all, yeah. that you want what your, your intention is to have Wi-Fi. Well, it's not just that. It, it will automatically turn Wi-Fi back on if you turn it off. It'll just turn it back on like the next day. Yeah. And I don't want that. Like, right, I, right, right. It says Wi-Fi will be off only until the next day. So if I turn it off. I like, want it off. You know, I know how to use my toggles. Me too. <laughs> Thanks, Apple. Thanks, Apple. Yeah. Hey, Apple also has another product out. The HomePod was released. Uh, it's coming out this week. Uh, might be today, actually. Uh, and some reviews are out. And guess what? Uh, as we expected, it's a very meh. It's a very expensive speaker. Yeah. Sounds good, apparently. I haven't heard it in person yet. 350 bucks. Only works with Siri. And um, <laughs> oh, Don't expect that to change anything. Well, Apple Music. And oh, Apple okay. Music. Okay. Only yeah. works with Apple Music. <laughs> uh, and only thing you can... No line in, of course. So you can't plug, you can't even use yeah. it as your home theater speaker. Um, and the features they promised when they announced it, including the ability to pair multiple of them together. Mm-hmm. For stereo. stereo sound, not available yet. Yeah. Only in uh, uh, when the new Bluetooth, um, or I'm sorry, when AirPlay 2.0 comes out, will that be enabled? You know, they had tr- trouble trouble with your AirPods, like when those first were supposed to be released. And that mm-hmm. was like, because those are two, those are stereo. Mm-hmm. And yeah. trying to get that to work, they're having issues with a uh, wireless audio, I guess. You know, one thing I learned about uh, that doesn't apply to HomePod, but was mentioned in the reviews for HomePod was that if you have a device that has the voice activated Siri, so you don't have to press the button, so your watch or one yeah. of the newer iPhones, uh-huh. uh, you don't have to pause after saying the activation phrase. You just say it, the whole sentence. Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's, always been the case with Amazon and everything else you don't have to pause no pause most people pause most people like. pause because you, you get the ding you want the, you want the acknowledgement yeah, right. that they're listening because the expectation that the technology yeah. isn't fast enough right but you actually don't you can just say yeah and I'm sorry for doing this you can say oh god hey Siri set a timer for 45 minutes oh, don't do this and there they did it yeah. I don't want you really want you to do that cancel yeah. good god Hey, you know what? Yeah, Amazon's kicking butt. Can we? I know we're talking about Apple and Siri and all, but I got to tell you, um, it, we're not at what we've been testing yet. But if you have kids, you need to tell your your Amazon device. I won't say it, not like Norm. I will. You have to say, "Let's play a game for kids," huh? Because they have like 250 new games in there, and Alexa will just throw out a few random ones every time you say this phrase. She'll say, "Do you want to play this? Do you want to play this?" And you just pick one and you play it, and they're all fun. Like it's like all my daughter wants to do now. Do you take advantage of the fact that those devices uh, on Google and Amazon side will recognize different voices? I don't. I didn't even know about that. So I, I was looking through the settings recently. I do. I do with my Google Home. Uh, so we have profile setup. So uh, there's certain things that I've enabled because it can control media because I have YouTube TV in my household. So yeah. I use it both for content restrictions, but also just um, uh, to open the right profile with like Netflix and other things. Uh, when it when it's voice activated in that way, uh, it's useful. But I have to say, the intercom feature has proven extremely useful with the echoes. Really? Yeah. So, like, it, you it, know, the we'll call, drop in thing. Yeah, we'll call each other from other rooms because it's like we have a long house. You and, do this? No kidding. Yeah, and it it works really well. Wow. Well, how do you do it? You just say drop in on living room. Yeah, I mean, you have to label all of your yeah. echoes with the with their location name. But yeah, it basically, in my house is like call the bedroom or but call don't, the. Don't you have to wait ten seconds or something? It takes like two or three seconds. Somebody has to answer on the other side. They do. Yeah. Okay. So it's not like you just show up there. But you, they do have that. Like mm-hmm. you can just show up, but it takes yeah time. It takes a little okay. time. All right, interesting. Um, but I found it useful. I mean, it's not as instantaneous as walking down the hall, but yeah. I think if you know you're busy doing something, like my wife has tried to get my attention from the kitchen, and her hands are full of yeah. doing stuff, and That's so cool. 
uh, it's been good. The um, uh, can we talk about YouTube TV yet? Yeah, man. Sure. Yeah. Oh, finally. Well, YouTube TV is on YouTube. Apple TV. And on Roku. And it on fin- Roku. Finally. Does it just use the YouTube app? It's no. App? No, they're separate. It's a, it's a separate app altogether. Um, after almost a year, yeah. has it been that it was just enabled with Chromecast uh, in, in terms of going to TV? Or there are some certain set-top boxes that you could go uh, that had it integrated. Finally, we have it on third-party apps. This is the 30... Five dollar a month service for forty channels, and you stood by this. You're still using this. Service? I'm still using it because it has unlimited cloud DVR, mm-hmm. um, and it has a good interface for searching um, content. There's still some tweaks I want to see in in that uh, user design. Have they added new stations? Um, no, they haven't. But I am pretty happy with the channel selection for my needs. Okay. But having it integrated into a third party thing like Apple TV and Roku now makes the experience like five times better because constantly casting stuff to your Chromecast yeah. is full of terror yeah. and like it, it's buggy as heck. Um, but now I can have my Google home control the TV and I skip commercials by saying like, go forward two minutes, mm. which is pretty cool. Nice. Oh, very uh, nice yeah. And, um, uh, but it, it's, it's eminently more usable than the fact it's on Roku. Now Google, uh, YouTube TV has ESPN as a part of the service. And Disney has said that they will be offering ESPN as a standalone a la carte for five dollars a month uh does that bode well for the future of espn on youtube tv or are those deals you think locked in uh i don't know i mean that, that's a great question i think from what i've read about espn's earnings and the decline in earnings and the increase in cost of uh of the licensing for like nba and nfl they're in a position where they want subscribers any way they can get them and so from what I understand, ESPN is going to try to be everywhere it can be. Yeah. So this standalone is really in response to cord cutters who are unsubscribing from cable, but they still believe live of live sports events people want. Uh, and so I, what's surprising to me that it's not bundled with this Disney app somehow. Right. That right. they don't just sell them both together for $10 a month. Because now you have, that would be really compelling. Well, maybe because the Disney app is not about live TV. It's not, and, and ESPN is all about live Sure. Day to day. I don't don't know. Um, I do you want to go back to a little about the HomePod and its comparison to other like competitors? Because uh, it's very easy for us to put it in a category of your Google Homes, Google Home Minis, your Alexas and Alexa Dots. Uh, but really feels like Apple isn't positioning itself on that, even though that's maybe what consumers say they want from Apple or something. But I don't know. If, uh, um, uh, most Siri users are probably not as happy as they are with Google Home or Alexa. Um, so they're really positioning the HomePod as just an expensive speaker with Siri control. This feels like a, a play against Sonos l- yeah, more than anything else. Totally. Sonos One. Uh, and I, I asked you about whether you guys use the multi-user functionality in the other devices because it's something that also Apple, the HomePod doesn't have. Uh, it's only one one voice, one user. If you ask to play a, a playlist, it is just your mm. your playlist and that's it. See that that becomes problematic in my household when it comes to Spotify playlists because we both have it, uh, and then you can't sort of switch between them unless you label everything correctly. Um, and then uh, also related to this in the world of home automation and digital assistants, uh, it looks like Nest is being folded back into Google. Uh, Google bought Nest, but it operated as a separate company uh, after it acquired it. And now it's announced that it's going to be back in the main Google business so they can get better better alignment between the, the technologies of the two companies and, and also uh, maybe get it farther out there. So that says to me uh, functionality that previously was just in Google Home. Um, and all that Google search potential, all that all that that voice recognition may get put in a nest. Okay, which I think is a logical thing for it to do. Yeah, I mean, wouldn't you like that thermostat to have the same features of the of the Google Home Mini? Why doesn't it have a microphone in it? So I I think the thermostat is the Trojan horse into your home. That's what we always yeah. thought Nest was, right? The thing that you always had a spot in your house for a thermostat. They replaced it with a, with a more expensive, maybe more functional, uh, cool looking for sure, um, digital item. And Nest never got to a point where they took that to a logical next step with voice recognition, with automation, full automation, uh, things that we're seeing creep into 
other digital assistant products like Google Home. So the, the Google Home device that you plug in, that speaker, like the speaker is another Trojan horse into your living room. Um, I feel it's more of an appliance when you have it in the place of like a thermostat than if you have it as a discrete item on, on your counter. So I'm really interested to see what, what they're going to come up with next. Cause you know, if it is something that's useful and you can plug it into your wall and it works as a thermostat and it works as an alarm system and it works as a digital assistant and, and does all the things that home does, I think that's a great place for it. I feel like it's going to get confusing if we have, if there's, if I ever have a reason to really switch over to Google home, and leave Amazon Alexa behind. That's gonna. That's a major switch. That's that's almost akin to switching from iOS to Android. And uh, I don't have that reason yet. Like Alexa can control my Nest right now. So that is the the one way is fine for me. And in fact, she does report the Nest can report the temperature back. So that mm-hmm. there is sort of a two way. You don't there. want higher integration because the your, the killer app is the assistant. Exactly. Yeah. So I don't know. I, but it would be nice if that was also a microphone. And if other information could be displayed on that display. And, you know, I, I doubt Google would open that up to third parties so that Amazon could do that. Like, it, w- it would be for Google Home. What a win for Amazon with an experimental product like the Echo and to have that in- embedded because they were first to market. And it totally. did the limited things that it could do well. It just makes getting into that space so much more difficult for other companies. And I gotta say, their skill SDK stuff is really good. They and they know about hosting third-party stuff because they, they do that so well with storage and compute. But they've integrated, they've allowed that system to give a leg up to the developers making things for Alexa. And there's so many skills now. As I was saying before, there's like 250 kids apps you can just muddle through. All right, a couple of things, more things in tech. Uh, the Verge got a really interesting exclusive on a pair of smart glasses uh, that Intel's making, and these surprisingly look like regular glasses. Yeah, well, they 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 forego a few things. Like they they've really prioritized the normal. Like they want it to look like a pair of glasses. And the norm. It. And they look like my glasses. The, they're calling it the Vaunt smart glasses, and all it is is a display. Like the the weird thing is, and if you watch the video, they don't make a big deal out of it. Is that there isn't a camera, there isn't even a microphone. Right. It's, no input. Yeah, it's just that. I mean, it's obviously wireless input for your phone, but that's it. It has these tiny processors on there, these ASIC processors that are very specialized. Like so, Intel has done what Intel does well, which is make silicon. And they've made it so tiny that it fits into what is essentially just a normal pair of glasses. Wait, so if there's no microphone, how do you interface with it? Your phone, presumably. Now, now, even The Verge says the microphone doesn't exist for now. Mm. Um, so who knows what, what's coming. But um, it's all strictly like it's just input from your phone. So you're getting updates. You're getting basically like mm-hmm. instead of getting yeah, a, an alert watch. on my watch, I'm getting an yeah. alert in my eye. So here's what I thought was interesting to me, um, not just the design of this, but they achieved this design by using a very compact display system. And it's a display system not unlike what we've seen in other devices in terms of retinal imaging, something yeah. that isn't a physical pixel by pixel display, but a projector that of light that goes right into your retina. It's so a low power it. laser. Low power laser is how they describe it. I know it sounds scary, but you know, so is shooting a DLP projector in your eyes with the the Avant, Avagon glyphs. But whereas the Avagon glyphs are basically Texas Instrument 720p micro mirror light images being bounced in your retina, what you have here is just a monochrome red image at a resolution of what is it, 450, 400 by 150, super low resolution. To me, this is Virtual Boy. Because <laughs> it's red, it's it's yeah. at low low resolution yeah. virtual boy. I wish it was stereo. in your eyes. If it was stereo, it would have a lot. You would have AR that. virtual boy. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I I actually be kind of interested in that, but um, I I think that this is neat. Um, just from I the fact that Intel's doing it, like it, it's a real hardware developer who wants to. It's interesting, also, like why would they be doing this? Like they're good at it, but why why do they want to be? involved in making the actual display device. I don't know. The miniaturization is cool, but I don't think that's what's holding back the technology. Yeah, what, what I do you think, think the is? proper interface so is what's holding uh, back. So assume it's yeah. not an interface device whereas it's not AR. This is not about uh, contextually having awareness of what you're looking at in the world. 
uh, it is purely display. In so many senses, it's like what Google Glass did, except Google Glass was full color display um, with with prisms and, and a discrete area. Um, what would you want in a 400 by 150 pixel rectangle in terms of information that you could have in your glasses? I'm having a hard time imagining any anything because I'll, personally, what I'm waiting for is the full thing. Like everywhere where there is tinted out your the ar yeah, experience yeah, 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 yeah. and we'll get, magically we'll have that you know at some point yeah but if something if for your daily wear yeah. it's wireless mm -hmm. that you have your phone tethered over bluetooth or something you know what is the what are the notifications what is that general is it time like if, if, well, if you had a running clock there it's everything I get on my watch. It's, it's text messages. You know, it's Slack inf so information. So, what take take out one extra step? What do you? What would you want in your periphery, and not something you'd want on a on a activation well, push notification well, basis? What if you could activate this? Like, let's say you could like look to a side and it would turn on or something like that. Well, it does actually dismiss things by doing that. Yeah. So, it, given that, um, maybe if you're exercising, heart rate. Sure. would be interesting like mm -hmm. some sort of exercise data uh if you're walking maybe some sort of direction capability mm -hmm. um bitcoin, could be interesting bitcoin price <laughs> sure uh yeah. and and text messages i mean those are the only three use cases that i think are interesting inside your glasses without ar capability compass compass where are you using a compass? <laughs> so you know what direction you're facing in. You can when see have, the, the north, south, your cardinal directions. When have you last used a compass? He's so easily lost. Uh, when I drive in other parts of the country that I'm, I'm not familiar in. <laughs> like, you know how cars have a compass? You Sometimes embedded in the mirror. A compass. I totally use that compass to know I'm going in the right direction. An explorer. <laughs> We got a regular Magellan <laughs> over here. Uh, I think it's super interesting. Um, and Intel hasn't said whether this is going to be a product or not. They're, you know, like you said, it's a hardware company that's trying to find use for its microprocessors um, and and applications where you would need tiny, tiny, efficient computers. Yeah. Um, so uh, who knows? But I'd love to see this. This is like the perfect thing to see at CES. I wish they, I wish they had it there, and I wish we were there to see it. Yeah. Uh, a couple more things. Um, Nintendo had another announcement. What? Mario Kart. Mario yes. Kart. Mobile on smartphones. Something I think we've been asking for for a long time. Well, come on. Now, don't be greedy. We've been asking for Nintendo on smartphones for a long time. And we, we finally got, got it. We yeah. did. We did. So Mario Kart seemed to be a, a no-brainer. And while we assume there will be another Mario Kart on the Switch sometime in the future, yeah. a 9 or whatever, uh, Mario Kart Tour which will be launching at the end of the 2019 fiscal year before March 2019. Oh, is it that soon? That's in a year in a year's time. 2019, oh. not 18. Oh, goodness. Yeah. Okay. March 2019 um will uh will be out on smartphones. That's all <laughs> that's literally all we know. Why are they talking about it now? Uh, because they're talking about the Switch service, the online service, $20 a year. Oh, for yeah. a virtual console, yeah, uh, and so it was it was announced as part of that. Okay. Can I just tell you the other day, um, we finally got a Wii, and my son discovered Mario Kart just a few months ago. And the other day, he was like, "Dad, I've gotten good at this game. You got to play with me." Yeah. And then I kind of put him in its place. Are so you I was like? Well, are you already good at, good at that game? I mean, I was fine. Mm -hmm. I was certainly better than my seven year old was, <laughs> okay. especially oh. when he started talking crap to me. Yeah, see those games that give those kids a false sense of achievement. Yeah, and then I was like, "You're not, you're not even drifting." <laughs> let's, let's get. <laughs> oh, I didn't know you knew uh, Mario Kart that well, Kishore. I know how to play Mario Kart. Cool. Um, I do want to talk about uh, an interesting technology trend, and this may be uh, has a, there's some adult subject matter involved here. Is so this not for kids to listen to? Not safe for work. Um. But there is a technology that's quite a bit of controversy right now. I read about it on, on Vice's Motherboard site. Uh, over the past couple months, there uh, originated through a, a subreddit um, called uh, Deepfakes. And basically, someone developed an app that uses machine learning and neural net processing to take Google image searches, searches and images, a repository of images of anybody, and map their face in video. 
Oh, I thought really because I heard about this and I thought people were doing this. It's all this is the this mapping is, the, is done by an AI. It's one hundred percent done by an AI, hmm. and the first application, the widespread application, of course, was pornography. And so this whole cult, subreddit culture, which I guess has been up for months now, uh, took was were taking celebrities and putting their faces mm-hmm. in porn videos. And the news recently is that this has now been shut down by Reddit and shut down by uh, Discord and just this uh, morning. They and announced it. Uh, um, so the, the, some of the other hosting sites. Uh, but the technology is can be applied anywhere, and people have now they've done it. Uh, versions the video that we can share is that they've put like Nicolas Cage's face in a bunch of movies, and even more topical going back to the, uh, Henry Cavill and Justice League and Mission Impossible, someone has taken footage of Henry Cavill just in interviews with his mustache and removed the mustache by combining it with faces, photos of Henry Cavill sans mustache. Well, is this all using the same software? All using the same software. I mean, is this really just like one guy open source some AI that does this and everyone's now using it? You, something on a five that you can download and you can run yourself. Huh. And someone even did the Princess Leia, uh, the Rogue One ending, and used and remapped the Whoa. CG Princess Leia that ILM made yeah. with one you, that the AI generated based yeah. on uh, Carrie Fisher's face from A New Hope. And the Nick Cages are mixed, but the Henry Cavill looks. A couple of them look good. And I will say that uh, all the caveats apply. That we're, what we're watching are low resolution YouTube videos mm-hmm. with compression. That we're not talking about the 4K, 5K quality that you need for uh, for studio work, and it's not perfect by any means. But the surprising quality of this stuff and relatively is, quickly is terrifying. Hmm. Um, and of course, there's all the implications on Twitter and Reddit and and um, and Discord about the legality and uh, and the privacy violations. Uh, of putting other people's faces using without their consent on videos that may be pornographic in nature or not. What I think, I mean, this is just a continuation of the conversation we had when Adobe debuted that Photoshop for voice. Yep. Um, And, you know, we saw that video of the Obama speech that never happened. Uh, So this is just another piece of that same arc. We are living in a Black Mirror episode. Like that's what it feels like because people can be generating fake videos and their versions, you know, of, of doctored versions that are very tough to distinguish. And someone, I forget who it was, but somebody suggested recently to me that even big stars now can actually take advantage of this by scanning themselves now when they're younger and then having an infinite career where they can stay on screen and look beautiful until they want to stop acting. That is the premise, very premise of the Robin Wright film, The Congress. They, there's a film about that very act where she she signs away her rights as an actor. She plays a version of herself hmm. um, and does a, uh, um, a light stage like uh, photogrammetry of her face, and then her likeness is then used in in other films. Yeah. What like? But she doesn't do the acting. No, she doesn't do the acting. Yeah, yeah. Huh. It's like they, it just signs it away. Is is the premise of the film? Wow. It's not that great of a film, but it's the, the, that total concept. Yeah, a digital actor um, that can be based and, and who owns the rights to likeness. I mean, you had the Crispin Glover lawsuit, the mm. landmark lawsuit in Back to the Future 2, two uh, where they used his likeness in makeup, um, hung upside down, of course, and he won over that. So it's, there's precedent about, you know, you're, you owning your likeness, uh, but that's not to say other people can still it's, do with it, you it, know, on the dark web. It, it's been happening in football. Like NCAA football players don't get compensated for their likeness being used in, in football games, sure. right? Sure. So some of these aren't settled like in, in that uh, way you suggested with Crispin Gelber. There's There's been losses there too. I mean, how do you want it to be? What should it be? I don't know. Because, yeah, I don't, I'm very, I, I'm I, left because like there needs to be some far footprint left, right? Because now we're in a place where like, if we get into the legality, somebody has to prove that this isn't real. Anymore. We're in a we're in a weird spot right now where most people don't even know this exists. You know, oh yeah. Like, despite despite we understanding Reddit, most people if they saw a video, they would right. just assume it's real. Yeah. And eventually there'll be a point where people ask and they say, "Well, hold on now, is that fake or is that real?" Uh, we're just watermarks on on digital footage to certify yeah. no no doctoring, all practical. 
or degrees of, of doctoring. I mean, that's not reasonable. That's not really going to happen. It's just a reality that we're going to live in. There will be a profession where, where experts will be able to discern whether it is yeah. real or not. I guess you have to hope that high resolution footage takes precedent and that the technology, the AI technology can't keep up and that the evolution of our brains that to recognize the uncanny valley that's yeah. all we can trust. Oh, right. Oh, that's a mistake. Thousands <laughs> of years of evolution for our brains to recognize a real face from a fake face. And ironically, we've been wishing all this time to surpass that uncanny. Isn't valley. that isn't that the <laughs> the, the catch twenty two? You guys have ruined us. <laughs> ruined us, I say. Yeah. So that was interesting. Um, if you uh, go to Motherboard's website, they've been following it since the development of of this subreddit, and uh, and you can read all about that's there. But I will give you a caution. It is uh, not safe for work. Uh, one final recommendation in terms of movies and tech. Uh, there's a blog on um, Pro Video Coalition called Art of the Cut. And they did a, one, they did a regular interview series with editors, of film editors. And um, one that was called to my attention that came out in October was the editor of Blade Runner 2049. And it's a long, long, long interview, but well worth reading if you want to hear about some interesting behind-the-scenes editing notes about how they put the film together. Um, and uh, it's it, it's, a, it's an art form as we approach the Oscars. It is Editing is an art form that we don't appreciate enough uh, in the filmmaking process. Uh, before we move to our next segment, I want to thank the sponsor of this week's episode, and that's uh, Milo. Milo is a new distributed Wi-Fi system that works with your current router setup, extending Wi-Fi coverage to the far reaches of Pluto or maybe, you know, Dagobah. Uh, with a simple mobile-based setup process, Milo is ready to go in minutes, and it uses SmartSeq technology to make sure your Wi-Fi problems um, are, or Wi-Fi performs where you need it the most and the problems go away. So visit milowifi.com slash test to learn more and use the offer code test to receive 10% off your system today. Once again, that's milo, M-I-L-O, wifi.com slash test with the offer code test and thank them for supporting this week's episode. Now it's time for a moment of science. Do you guys ever... um... Uh, what do you call it? Uh, forget words from time to time? Yeah, often. Yeah. Um, well, there was a new study out this past week that was covered in the New York Times uh, that I think is really interesting. They they found a series of epileptic patients and implanted a, a brain implant, like essentially one that would send just electrical impulses to a really specific area hmm. with the purpose of aiding recall of words. And the idea is these epileptic patients have damage to memory centers. And if we're able to tell when their brain is functioning properly and when it's not, we could turn on this brain implant that almost functions like a pacemaker to enhance the memory recall of an area Mm -hmm. um, by sending these targeted electrical impulses into areas. And they tested it out with um, a small set of patients and word recall improved 15%. Okay. Which is pretty significant. Now, this device, like before you get like, you know, fancy ideas of what this looks like, they're basically tethered to this machine. Mm-hmm. The, this is a implant with electrodes coming out and has really specific placement. But the hope is if we can use a simplified system like this of understanding when high function, we're in a high functioning or low functioning state and sending these targeted impulses, now we might be in a position to think about depression, anxiety, and doing real-time treatment of this so that you can have high-functioning brain activity at all times. This is pretty invasive, though, because we're talking about electrodes this is an imp- in your brain. This is not an EEG. Yeah, and this is not for us. This is not for normal, healthy adults. This is really about uh, people that have impairment. But think about it in the context of this way. Alzheimer's patients, especially ones that are really progressing, lose about 15% of their memory capacity um, uh, over the years. But that's so a this is degenerative about, disease yeah. where this would not help with that necessarily because not in its current state, gone. but it could be. Okay. It could help with recall. Now, if it's just helping recall certain words, it may not be able to restore memories and stuff, but the technology holds some 
promise for that. It's never going to be like the thing like, oh, I need to cram for a test. I'm going to, you know, all of a sudden put an implant in my brain and, and be smarter. Yeah. Right. right. But <laughs> tracking that machine. Hold on, teacher. I'm not ready for the test yet. Then we get these electrodes in. All right. There's one thing we don't talk about enough of on this podcast. What is it? Gonorrhea. Oh, like, not what can, I thought. Like, we only talked about gonorrhea once last year. You added this? Just once, yes. Yeah. So Jeremy <laughs> brought this up at lunch today, and I was like, Perfect damn time. it, <laughs> we're going to talk about gonorrhea again. And so the, the time we talked about it last year, we talked about how there is growing resistance to gonorrhea uh, uh, resistance to the uh, antibiotic resistance riding, rising, yeah. um, mostly in Africa, was the story we talked about last year. Uh, there's a cocktail of antibiotics used to treat gonorrhea. There's two, in fact, that are used uh, most commonly. And a, a recent study that was completed of 3,000 uh, people in China establishing what the resistance to those drugs are. And they respectively grew 4% and 2% over that time period. And while that doesn't seem like a lot, that is pretty rapid expansion of antibiotic resistance, especially in the context of how many gonorrhea cases there are a year, which there are 70 million, 78 million cases of gonorrhea worldwide. Gonorrhea has some lingering effects. Even though you live with it, it can cause issues with fertility. Um, and then if you're pregnant, it actually can pass along to the baby. No kidding. Uh, so this is not a, a a a small issue, and there's something like a half million cases, I think, in the U.S., something like that. So this growing bacterial resistance is interesting. I have to admit, I don't think I heard the word gonorrhea in my life until I watched that Seinfeld episode. Mm. Do you know what I'm talking about? No. There was an episode where Kramer gets a job at a medical school pretending to be a patient with different symptoms. And he does. He takes it so seriously and does so well acting out some of the the conditions. He keeps getting typecast as the gonorrhea patient. And he's like, I got gonorrhea again. <laughs> oh boy, <laughs> Wait, what's gonna get us, Kishore? Is it gonna be the bacteria or the viruses? Uh, well, what's gonna get us in the end? Well, I mean, because it's a bad flu season. I think we are. I think the the stuff this past week that really struck me as as terrifying is. There's big budget cuts at the CDC, mostly against guarding against pandemics breaking out. And when you saw what happened with Ebola a few years ago, I think I'm much more concerned about a, a pandemic of viruses um, than the slow degrading of antibiotics right now. Um, because when that viral outbreak happens, there's really not much we can do. And this flu season, we've seen like healthy people our age uh, go like pass away in, in a matter of days. Uh, from the strength of, of 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 just the common flu, is that across the, our country? Yeah, there, I mean, there was a woman in San Jose that passed away a couple weeks ago that was a marathon runner. Wow, and was healthy Sunday night, Wednesday morning she was she was gone. Uh, so uh, I would say I'm more scared of that, but I'm not sure the listener should feel a sense of existential dread about it. Okay, on to the VR minute. <laughs> The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. All right, just a couple things we want to talk about. First of all, we got a question from uh, a listener, and it's a podcast email. Want to, it's a nice time to give you guys a reminder that if you have questions that you want us to answer on the podcast, we'll take them. You can just send an email uh, to podcast at com, and you can tag us on Twitter too or tag us on Twitter we'll address some of these but I thought this was an interesting question it says uh, I have an Oculus Rift and when people are over for a dinner party or get together sometimes VR comes up and I always offer people the opportunity to try out my Rift typically in these situations you have about at most 15 or maybe 20 minutes to give them some short intro to VR normally they're first VR experience. I often show them first uh, the home, then robot experience and face your fears and either uh, uh, rip coil or the football game VR sports challenge uh, with a touch controller. Sometimes they get it, sometimes they don't. Uh, what would your 15 minute VR elevator pitch be? If you had a streamlined 15 minute demo, what would it be? I, I think it depends on how much space you have. I think I have a small space and so I, when I've done this, and I did this over the holidays with my family, I went to Job Simulator was my go-to because I think it's fun. It's really easy to pick up. Uh, and then if 
uh, once we get through Job Simulator, if there's time, I really like the climb still. Oh, wow. I mean, even though it's a tougher game, I like the the mechanic of that game um, and just the, the real world tangibility of it. Like, I think people can r- really easily relate to rock climbing. So it's not like this shoot 'em up people getting into your personal space, which is what I want to avoid in these first time experiences. Uh, that's where I go. The climb is scary. Like that's it the is. only thing. But then again, that like, shows off that yeah. VR can do that. Uh, my experience has been people are um, more comfortable in climbing than the oh, climb for sure. whatever reason. There's just less fear of heights because it maybe just looks less realistic. Uh, but you find that people get it immediately. Yeah, they, they get the movement, the one to one. They get the the grappling motion. It's a yeah. I don't know some people have a hard time with the jumping because it's kind of a weird. You have to let go at the right time. But in, in addition to those, uh, Space Pirate Trainer is is my go to. Mm-hmm. It's like the Galaga VR, and then oh um, uh, gosh, there's a job simulator. You're right, is definitely good. The, the, what was that deep blue one? You know the, the ocean. Blue, the blue. That used to be a great one for I, presence, but you don't have hand presence in that one. Yeah. So. I was gonna say like it's a really good first entry, uh, and it, or at least it used to be. But now it just it doesn't. It, nobody's ever done in that app and said I love VR. <laughs> it's yeah. like, but it's it's comfortable because there's nothing to do. But the one like I have had people over and they haven't been impressed by with anything we've discussed. And then I put them in a creative app, like uh, Medium, Medium mm. or Tilt Brush, and mm. and they're just like, whoa, now this is something special. And yeah. those people are typically artists. Mm. So it depends um, on the person. Fruit Ninja. I would say you immediately get it. People sure. have the, uh, relatable. It's not discomforting at all, and you have interaction. Um, uh, yeah, I think, I, I mean, these are, for better or worse, they're, they're old titles, like, and most of them are pretty cheap. So, um, you know, going through, I think, what's the one that when you put people in it, they want to stay in there for more than 15 minutes, and they're, no one takes off the headset and says, oh, okay, I see, I'm done. I think mm. it's got to be Tilt Brush. Yeah, it depends on the person. I mean, it's not for everybody, but if if, right. if you're a, if you have that ability, I, I think for sure uh, or, I, or medium. I played Lone Echo with my nephew, and he was really into it, and so he took it off only because you're moving around a lot. Yeah. That's the thing. I think yeah. Lone Echo, while it's the most impressive, I think that's the one that has for people with no VR legs or first time, they're not going to get that. And that's not a first time game, but I mean, we did that after a couple of days, but I mean, it was still, yeah, it was, but it was probably the one that, uh, that it is the one that I would stay in the longest at this point. Nice thing about space pirate trainer is it has a party mode where uh, yeah. you, you just, it's like, there's no UI. You just put it in this mode and suddenly everybody who plays has eight minutes to do as well as they can. I wanted to say fantastic contraption, but I think it's too hard. For mm. people, because you're doing multiple things, you're learning or asking someone to experience VR for the first time, and then also solve a puzzle. Yeah, I I would normally recommend VR Sports Challenge being the goalie in the ice hockey game, but I like broke part of my wall playing that <laughs> a while ago, and so I have some bad feelings. Someone needs to make the new intro app that does all of this. It's like in one experience, one after another, you just like as a, some sort of continuum where you're progressing through this experience and you get all of that first VR experience. That'd be fun. <laughs> uh, next up in VR, we have our first looks at the prototype, the pre-release version of Oculus Go. We did for a moment. Developers, some developers have the Oculus Go and shared a few photos of the box. Uh, so we were able to learn a couple things. Uh, we know now, of course, there is no micro SD card slot. There's only a USB jack, so we don't know if external storage is going to be available. Presumably, well, we did a USB know that. key. Carmack had mentioned that. Yeah, but we still don't know whether a USB key will even let you have oh, media. Have media on it. Exactly. Yes, exactly. Um, but it does. It ships with 32 gigabytes of onboard storage. That's what the box indicates, right? 32. Yes. Yeah. yes. Um, so we didn't know that. Um, other than that. There's not much, not much new about the Go. We still haven't seen put our heads in the headset. Uh, the audio is something that we experienced when we did the Santa Cruz prototype last year, mm-hmm. um, but it tells us we're getting closer. If developers are developing for it, uh, <laughs> my feeling is that there's not going to be any side loading. I think it's just going to be off their store. That's well, how they're going to justify that two hundred dollar price point. Certainly, if Apple were making this device, that's how they'd make it. That's how you make the money. Yeah, can't blame them. Is um, it dead on arrival? However, yeah. that's the thing. It's like it's an Android device. Let me. You expect to be able to sideload things on there? Yeah, 
Yeah. No, no, uh, no SD card slot. I don't know. I, I'm excited for this device. Um, um, and I'm, you know, more than even the experiences, what I'm most excited about is just to see what it's like to have an, a fully 100% only VR device. Yeah. Like they're going to have invented some way that it's just constantly VR. There's absolutely no uh, whatever you call it, dashboard OS. Right. You put it on and you're, you see the menu. Yeah. It pops on. Out of sleep mode, see the menu. I want to see that. Um, John Carmack tweeted something yesterday. He was not very excited about this revelation because he was more focused on the uh, the Falcon Heavy because uh, he's he's a big rocket guy. Yeah. Uh, but he talked about how on Oculus Go, they found a way to get those subpixels and make more out of those subpixels. Uh, so Oculus Go has a higher resolution screen than the the Rift. Uh, but it's a uh, you know it's it's AMOLED and it's um, or it's OLED and it's uh, subpixel arrangement is probably not RGB stripe, but Oculus knows exactly how the subpixel arrangement will go, and so what they can do is do subpixel rendering, uh, which presumably is like um, uh, like clear type font font rendering on uh, LCD monitors. Hmm. Um, so think of a, a pixel as being split into multiple components, you know, of different colors of RGB and, and more of one color than the other. And if you're trying to do anti-aliasing online and not have the jaggies, uh, you can use the subpixels to create a smoother line, even though you lose color control and you maybe see fluctuations in color around the, around the edges. Um, so it's cool. We have a new episode of Projections coming up on Friday, hopefully, um, if the edit gets finished. And uh, in it, we will be talking about Sprint Vector, which uh, we can't go too much in now because we are embargoed, but it is, uh, we're very positive on it. We, it's a fun game. They've added a lot to the single-player experience that we had not seen uh, when we had demoed it at shows. Yep, and also we'll be talking about, based on your recommendations out there, uh, the game In Death. So stay tuned for that uh, later this week. Uh, but... Until then, I think we're done. We're out of time for this week's episode. Uh, we'll be back next week with another episode of This is Only a Test. And do we have an, have an outro for this week? You always do this so fast. I'm like, all right, hold on. Let's it see. always comes to the end. Yeah. <laughs> I know, but you talk about what's untested. Ah, okay. Uh, go on the site and please watch our videos visiting Ardman Animation. Uh, we had uh, shot a bunch of videos while they're in production for Early Man, which unfortunately comes out in the U.S. the same day as Black Panther. But I'm hopefully see both. And uh, it gives great insight into the stop motion animation process. Oh, that's, that's just what I needed. <laughs> Hi there, I didn't see you. Test it. And one of their fan favorite characters is Squirrel Girl. Okay. And they have cast the new warriors for a TV show. Next story. On, on, on... Test it. I fold my arms as well, because sure. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>